I am so excited to have these two amazing ladies on my side and to be at MLK Public Library. <laughs> There is absolutely a reason why we call this homecoming. Rest is resistance is because DC has been my home forever and I'm just so happy to be here with all of you. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna do, we're not gonna do the traditional bios because you should know who these two amazing authors are. <laughs> and if you don't, please Google immediately. <laughs> But Alex L. is an author, a breath coach, a woman of many, many talents. And I have been following you, girl, I don't even know how long. I feel like we're family now. We're family. Yeah. Because I'm sitting on the stage with you, but I feel like we've been kinship from, for years now. Because when I have a problem and I feel a certain kind of way, I know I can go to your social channels, I can go to your books and feel seen. Thank you. Thank, no, thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> And it's in me. Yes, ma'am. We were talking backstage, and I'm, I'm going to clue y'all in. The last time I saw this beautiful woman, we were on an island. Half naked, on yep. the beach. Yes. 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 <laughs> there are pictures to prove it. <laughs> yes. Like, no BS. We were literally on an island, living our best lives. Yes. We got to meet Alice Walker. That's right. Wow. That's yes. right. This That's is right. Before the COVID days. That's right. You know, and so I have been following your work and your journey for such a long time. And in 2023, you've published over 31 books. Yes. And yes. author, publisher, all the things. You will get to learn more about her amazing career in this conversation. But you are just such an incredible soul and such a beautiful friend. So thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we are going to start this off. Both of you will read at some point, but I thought the best way to just open up this conversation was to say, how did you start your healing journey? Oh. It's a big question, but we're going to start there. And maybe, Alex, you can maybe like ease us into this. Like, how did you start your healing journey? Oh my gosh, in therapy, um, I was like 19 or 20. <laughs> and um, feeling really broken and depleted and unsure. I had no idea who I was, where I wanted to go. I didn't really have anyone leading by example as far as centering joy and self-love and choosing myself and all these different things. And I remember going to therapy, this amazing Southern therapist, Miss B, and she encouraged me to be kind to myself for the first time. Mm. I've always been a writer. Um, <clears throat> I'm the only child, so I used to do a lot of like corny novella style stories and then recording them in a karaoke machine and then playing them back. <laughs> so there was kind of like my boredom, but also my creativity. And then in high school, I was a, one of those sad emo poets. <laughs> Um, and I remember her telling me, why don't you try being nice to yourself? Mm -hmm. And the first thing I thought was, how do I even do that? No one has taught me how to do that. And she was like, well, why don't you start by saying a kind thing about yourself? Mm. Um, try writing a letter to yourself. And I remember thinking how stupid that was. I was like, girl, why am I paying you to tell me? <laughs> to write a letter to myself. I need answers. <laughs> and I, I will never forget this, and I carry this with me through my writings and my teachings, that she said, you are your own greatest healer and teacher. Mm. I don't have your answers, you do. Yeah. And that was the first time in my life that anybody gave me permission to choose myself and to find my own path. Yeah. And so that's how it got started. I wish I knew where Miss B was today. So I could give her a hug because mm. she really did shift my life by encouraging me to rewrite my narrative. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It's so beautiful. I think there are two specific moments that I can point to. One was becoming a mother. And I know that sounds like such a corny entry into like, how did you hear yourself by having babies? <laughs> but. But there were so many things that I, that I felt negatively about myself mm -hmm. as a black woman in America. I am dark skin, I have natural hair, I have wide hips. I, you know, like I, I'm a nerd. I, there were just a bunch of different ways that 
society conspired to tell me that I was never going to be enough. Mm -hmm. He were conspired. Right. Mm -hmm. And when I had my children and they came out looking like me, like my twin is right there in the middle of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, all that time that I had been putting myself down and telling myself, you know, like agreeing with everyone that, you know, like, oh, well, dark skin is not good or mm -hmm. natural hair is not good or, you know, you can't be pretty because you don't look like that and mm -hmm. you never will look like that. How can I look at this like mirror image of me mm -hmm. and love her and tell her every day, you are so beautiful, my God, you take my breath away, which I do to this day. They'll tell you, like, leave me alone, dear. <laughs> Please stop. I'm your biggest fan. But um, how could I tell them that they were beautiful and then see the same exact face in the mirror yeah. and continue to tell myself that I wasn't? Yeah. And so my healing came from raising these children, these daughters, to... Um, to think about themselves differently from the way that I did, yeah. right? And, and teaching them, I was teaching myself. And in their learning, they were teaching me. Yes. The second um, one came when I got divorced, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, for 22 years, I was somebody's wife. Yeah. And after 22 years of being someone's wife and playing that role, mm -hmm. and there, there is, you know, like there's a lot of performance that goes into a marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there's a lot of performance that goes into being someone's mother. There's a lot of performance that goes into being what other people expect you to be. Right. Um, and the second that I got divorced, I had to stand there and sit in this room and figure out, well, who are you? Yeah. Mm. Who are you without being his wife? Who are you if you're not in this space where you're being their mother? I remember, um, Mari, my older daughter, going away to school and my younger daughter spending one week with her dad and then one week with me. And when she would go over there, I would just be sitting in my house like, well, what am I supposed to do now? <laughs> like, what, like, like, for yeah. real, like, I can't sit here and watch Real Housewives of Atlanta, you know, like, <laughs> for the entire seven days. So, like, there has to be yeah. some kind of um, reckoning, yeah. right? Mm. And so my friend Karen Good who is one of my favorite writers on the planet and also someone who talks to me regularly about writing but is also a very dear friend of mine, told me to, when I'm sitting down to write, to free write in a journal mm -hmm. at least four pages without thought. Just open up the journal and start writing. And by the fourth page, the truth comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just kept doing that and kept doing that mm. and kept doing it. And by the fourth page, the truth was coming out. And I was telling myself a lot of things about my pain. I was mm -hmm. telling myself a lot of things about what I needed to do to heal. Yeah. Mm. And it's all in this journal. And I'm sitting here like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting with a master. But I was doing this. Mm. That's how I came out of that. Mm -hmm. was yeah. like learning how to talk to myself yeah. mm -hmm. and really understand what was deep down in here that needed to be on the page. Mm. And that's what ended up in One Blood. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm so excited to hear both of you share your vulnerabilities in this way because I think we underestimate the fact that taking a pen or a pencil and writing it down and really trying to be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. it can manifest so much healing, so much vulnerability. It can open <clears> up a whole new world of possibilities. But I think there's, with that hesitation, like you said earlier, when Miss B told you to be kind to yourself, you're like, ma'am, what are you talking <laughs> about? Like, what is the actual work? Mm. And I think that's like the, the next question I wanna pose because another reason I love reading your books, visiting you on social, is because you give us tools, very practical tools about answer this question, how does it make you feel? Mm -hmm. How do we get to that practicality of thinking one thing or even feeling it in theory, but then actually doing the work? Like, do you have any insight or guidance when it comes to doing the work of healing yourself? I often say that it's just not that deep. Yeah. And I think people make healing really deep. Mm -hmm. Something that I tell my students and my clients often is like, just get back to basics. Yeah. Who are you? 
who are you? And that is a hard question to answer yeah. because a lot of times people want to write down, I'm a mother, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a wife, all these different things, roles that they are to other people. But no, who are you to you? Mm-hmm. Um, how are you feeling? Yeah. Where does it hurt? Like these are not deep questions. They are questions that we don't ask ourselves Mm -hmm. often, which makes them feel a lot more layered, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be this complicated, whimsical um, language. It can be simple language. And so that's what I really had to um, come to terms with. Like it doesn't have to be fancy. It can, it can be free, it can be easeful, and it can be hard, but I don't have to try to trick myself into healing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's really important, especially as a black woman. Yeah. Everything feels like a heavy lift already. Like our healing shouldn't be, not shouldn't, our healing doesn't have to be mm-hmm. another heavy lift right. that we can't even compute. Yeah. Right. And so getting back to basics, and that's what I learned in the pandemic. Like self-care mm-hmm. is getting back to basics. Am yeah. I washing my face? Am I drinking water? Am mm-hmm. I going for my daily walks? Yeah. Am I practicing gratitude just by putting my feet on the floor and b- having breath in my body? Mm. As a mom of three, it is hard. Yeah. As a wife, it is hard to make sure you're intentionally caring for yourself because you're caring for other people. Yeah. And, and so it's been like, okay, Alex, how, do you, how can you get back to basics? How do you feel today? Yeah. How do you feel right now at this moment? Right. Oh, he's sound like my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I so tell me how you feel. <laughs> like, I literally was in therapy this, this Monday and I was like, post festival, I'm about to do da, 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 da. And she was like, ma'am, you can do that right now. Mm. <laughs> she was like, how about you practice mindful eating? How about you practice mindfully, like, should like, well. take your son for a walk, listen to the leaves. Like, like, like I was like, wait, but I'm going to do that after the festival's <laughs> over. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, no, 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 today. Like, yeah. start to think about mm-hmm. how you can embed this into your everyday routine. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like you said, don't make it that deep. Like, yeah. you don't need to schedule this three weeks in, in advance. advance. That's right. Because <laughs> that's like, what you I can want. go for that's a walk right now. Right now. Yeah. Right. 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 And she was like, mindful eating. I was like, what's, what's that mean, mindful eating? Mm-hmm. She was like, chew slowly. <laughs> like, it's a thing, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, right. actually the embodying all that. Right. So I'm going to turn to you because I know this beautiful, beautiful book, this memoir, this, like, story of your life had to be a shedding. Mm. Like a, a piece of you that required you to be completely honest, completely vulnerable. Yeah. How did you take care of yourself in the process of writing the story? And say, also, also stay true to yourself. And to, because I feel like I'm also working on a memoir. And yay. So do you ever feel like the, what's on the page and what's happening, like a, a sense of dissonance? Mm. Like I have to go back to these memories and <laughs> pull well, together. Okay, so this is, it's, it's, memoir-ish, but it's, okay. it's, it's a novel mm-hmm. that incorporates some stories of my life. Um, and during the course of doing research for the story, the story is about, it's called One Blood, mm-hmm. and it's a triptych of stories. The first story is about a young girl who has a baby and has that baby taken away. The second story is about the adoptive mom who gets that baby. Mm-hmm. And the third story is about the baby herself as a grown-up and a mother in her own right. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the, the story, oh, this is about to fall off my ear. Um, the story kind of um, follows along my own journey as a child of adoption. Um, you know, I, I'm, during the course of, of writing the book and researching for the book, I didn't know who my birth mother was. I didn't know a lot about the circumstances behind my adoption. And the, um, <laughs> the journey to finding out about myself mm-hmm. while studying history mm-hmm. and sort of the history around adoption, yeah. I made some really personal discoveries yeah. that really kind of put me on my heels. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, like, You know, my background is as a journalist and as a memoirist for other people, Mm -hmm. right? Like Steve Harvey, (laughs) Taraji, all all the people. (laughs) Charlie Wilson and Taraji Henson and Jesse Norman. And when you see your, when they saw their life on the page, um, 
you had, there's, there was always two reactions. Oh God, thank goodness it's done. And then it's like, Ooh, what did I, what did I do? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's like, you know, hurt. Like, do we need that chapter? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we need that chapter. Yes. Cause A, I wrote it and I'm not coming up with 20 more pages <laughs> and B, because people deserve to see the full story yeah. mm-hmm. and it's scary as hell yeah. when you when you see your life on the page and then you have to reckon with mm. seeing your life on the page and how other people are going to respond yeah. to it and so a big deal for me with one blood it's fiction mm-hmm. right but people will see some things in there that they can relate directly to my own life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I don't want anybody looking at this and thinking, oh, that's all, oh, that, right. all of that is Deneen right there, <laughs> all that, because it's not. Right. Um, it's a figment of my imagination, mm-hmm. but it is, um, it was eye-opening. It was an eye-opening experience. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I think that like, for me, as I was writing, I felt like the research is such a require, like you have to do the research on your own life. Like I would talk to my brother and I would write down or I would Google different dates. Like, what was that song? What was that SWV song I was listening to with my best friend? (laughs) Like I really had to do research on my own life to write my own narrative. Absolutely. But I feel like whether you're one who wants to publish a book or write a memoir, everyone should do that research. Like really looking back and say like, okay, as you said, who am I? Who am I becoming? And not relying on this fixed identity. Like you can grow. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I want to take this moment because Alex, your new book, How We Heal, is so so fantastic. It's so it's in your voice, and I would love for folks to hear you read a little bit. Could this be a good time for you to read for us? Sure. Yeah. I didn't dog ear anything, so I'm just gonna like just, just flip. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hold on. Let's see. It comes out in November, y'all. November eighth. Yes. Please. And I read. will be at the Howard Theater with Nedra Tawab on the sixth. Yes. So y'all should come out and hang with us. It's going to be fun. Pre-order. I see folks pulling out their phones. If your phone is out, (laughs) pre-order the book. Um, Okay. Hold on. Okay. There is a story that I want to read. Why don't you ask her a question? Well, no, I there's no problem. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to say, when we were talking about, um, you know, researching your own history in order to get the words on the page, mm-hmm. I found out that I was born in a home for unwed mothers. Mm-hmm. Mm. While I was researching something, I I think I Googled, what was it like to be a 16 year old unwed, you know, like pregnant um, mom, mom to be Mm -hmm. in the Mm sixties. And somehow it led me to this page of a bunch of people looking for their mothers or looking for their children Mm. who were a part of or born in the Booth Memorial Hospital system. Mm. Now, when you're adopted, you have a, a short Um, birth certificate. Everybody else has the pleasure of having a long form birth certificate that tells you, you know, like what time you were born so you can do your your natal charts, Um, you know, all all that stuff, right? Like I don't have, I didn't even, until uh, until very recently, I didn't even know that my actual birthday was my actual birthday Mm -hmm. until maybe like a month ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, And so I see these Booth Memorial Hospital, people looking for Booth Memorial Hospital, you know, babies or having, you know, been born there. And I'm like, what is this Booth Memorial Hospital thing? That's what's on my birth certificate. Mm. Oh, wow. And so then I go to find out what Booth, come to find out that Booth Memorial Hospital was a home for unwed mothers. Wow. wow. Um, and a, a series of unwed, uh, of house of homes for unwed mothers run by the Salvation Army, oh, wow. where about 88% of the children who were born in those were taken from their mothers and given to mm. couples who were living up to this ideal that the United States had created after World War II, wow. um, saying that everybody should be married and have 2.5 kids and a white picket fence. Mm-hmm. Like that wasn't just a saying; that was a that was a directive. Yeah. And for those couples who couldn't have 
um, babies by natural childbirth. Mm -hmm. They needed babies. Yeah. And two million kids got snatched up. Mm. Oh, wow. Between 1960-something and 1977. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, 1940-something and 1977, yeah. So yeah. finding yourself on the page for real happened with, yes. <laughs> with this book, for sure. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found it. Okay, she read. <laughs> she read. Ready. That, that was a wonderful interlude. <laughs> um, so how we heal is essentially a reclamation of emotional well-being. Um, I open the book with, for my readers, when we heal ourselves, we heal our lineage. Healing is an act of community care. And I'm going to read um, from the section called Befriending Our Fear which is section two, and um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just read a little, okay? Um, when I was 10 years old, I had a formative experience with my biological father, an experience that planted a seed of fear in me that would flourish in the decades to come. My father was an on and off again presence in my life, and whenever he came around, chaos ensued. On this particular day, we were in his car on Interstate 495, and he was speeding and steering the car using only his knees. Daddy, please stop, I said, horrified. He kept accelerating and laughing. My fear and safety meant nothing. Daddy, please, I'm scared, I begged. He turned up the music and accelerated some more, using his knees to steer. Please stop, I screamed tucking my head in between my legs, praying that he wouldn't crash the car on the beltway. I could feel tears welling up in my eyes. I didn't know what was happening or why. He slowly realized that I wasn't having fun and I could feel the car slowing down. I wasn't gonna crash us. I know how to drive, he scoffed. What, you don't trust me? More than two decades later, I am still traumatized by that experience. Aside from my husband, I rarely let even the closest people drive me places. And when I have, my heart pounds the entire trip. Looking back on that experience makes my stomach hurt and eyes water. I remember my heart racing. I remember thinking I never wanted to see him again. I remember feeling like he was a dangerous man who didn't care about me. I remember being mad at my mother for letting him take me for the weekend. I remember being scared to death. So much ran through my mind for weeks and weeks after that experience. I didn't tell my mom because I was asked not to. As a young child, I became the gatekeeper of my dad's secrets and lies, whether it was him endangering my life on multiple occasions or the numerous women I had to bounce between when I would visit him. Being an adult reflecting on one of the many traumatizing experiences I had with him, I can see clearly where I learned to be scared of things to be scared of living. For years, I didn't tell a soul, not even my husband. Ryan would be so confused about why I was jittery in the car, and he wouldn't understand my unspoken fear or feelings of not being safe. It wasn't until writing about it all these years later that I started to look at and process the deep pain I carried from that experience. My husband showed me compassion and love when I shared this secret with him and he promised to keep this in mind as he was dri driving. Ryan is a great driver and protector. Open-heartedly, he listened and assured me that he would keep me and our children safe always. He gave me the sense of safety and assurance that I didn't have that night with my dad when we were flying down 495. My relationship with my biological father continued to be confusing and complicated for many years. When I turned 17, I ceased all communication with him to protect myself from his repeated dangerous and traumatizing behavior, both emotionally and physically. I haven't seen him since. He's never met my children. I didn't know it back then, but that act of separation was the first time I had ever really chosen myself. It was the first time I put aside my fear of rejection. <clears throat> my fear of heartbreak and shame to decide to do what was best for me. It took years for me to process the parental trauma I'd been carrying so close to my chest. Mm -hmm. Writing is what helped me process and separate my pain from theirs. 
It's the thing that welcomed me to be sad, angry, upset, and devastated for feeling let down at every turn. But it's also the thing that taught me how to find joy in healing, ease in changing, and forgiveness when putting things down that never belonged to me in the first place. Thank you for sharing that. That was absolutely so beautiful. And it makes me think of so much that we hold on to as adults Mm -hmm. that we experience in childhood. Mm -hmm. And this idea of healing the inner child is not exaggerated. It is so necessary Mm -hmm. because we are walking beings, these adults with jobs and mortgages and responsibilities, (laughs) still feeling the trauma and the hurts of things that happened when we were young, innocent people. Yeah. Um, I'm so, I'm so, so glad you shared that story because again, I'm like, give us the tools, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> how, you know, how, because I don't even know if everyone realizes that they're holding on to these childhood memories mm-hmm. and traumas that have been unresolved, unhealed. How do you awaken them and not be afraid? I don't think there's a way to do it and not be afraid. Mm. I don't really believe in being fearless. No. I believe in doing things scared especially when it comes to healing, because our healing is not just about us. Yeah. It's about generations after us. Yeah. I mean, it's about healing our lineage thoroughly, not mm-hmm. just the generations after us, but also like I see my mom and my grandmother doing their healing work and they're in their 50s. Well, my, my, my mom is in her 50s and my grandmother is in her 70s. Mm-hmm. And they're just now really starting to see what healing is for them because I chose to heal. Right. And so I used to get really pissed off about that Mm -hmm. because I'm like, why do I have to be the matriarch of healing? Right. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Why do I have to be the one leading the way? Yeah. And I unpacked that in therapy a lot. I remember I had a big breakdown when I was, when I turned 30. I'm 33 now. But when I turned 30, I was like, what in the hell Mm -hmm. is going on? I thought I dealt with this thing 10 years ago, but really what I was doing was sweeping things under the rug, like right. looking at things on the surface and then being like, okay, fine, you know, right, next. next. Mm-hmm. But what I, what, what I realized is that we can't keep turning away from the things that scare us, yeah. especially when it's so far reaching. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I speak from experience there because my mom turned away from the things that scared her and she was a really challenging parent yeah. filled with rage, filled with anger mm. and the inability to love me yeah. because she would not look at her own stuff. Mm-hmm. And so as I look at my stuff, I'm doing my daughters a deep intentional service because I don't want to repeat cycles of trauma. Yeah. I don't want my daughters to be teen mothers. Like I was a teen mom. I had Charlie who's sitting over there in the corner. I was 18. And it's through mothering my children that I learned to remother myself. Like, what does that even mean? What do I need? How can I be the best for them? I mean, just this morning I had to apologize to Charlie. Mm -hmm. I've never had anybody apologize to me ever. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like those little pieces are healing and not being scared to be like, yo, I was wrong and I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether that be to your child or to your spouse or to yourself. Oh, yeah. I think self-forgiveness is really like to loop back to your question. Self-forgiveness is really probably the scariest thing to do because then we have to release the idea that we have to hold ourselves hostage. Right. So that's really where the healing happens. Like, hold yourself, like give yourself permission to really hold yourself and be soft with yourself. I think especially as black folks, we are so conditioned to be hard because the world is hard, but we are soft. We are a soft place to land. And like giving ourselves the permission to do that is major. And that's what I've been doing. And that's how I've been healing. Thank you. It's just so amazing because again, between the both of you, I know we're sitting on the stage and we've had some key keys together, <laughs> but I feel like there, I always tell people that you don't necessarily need to need to meet someone in order for them to mentor you. Mm. They can mentor you through their books, 
through watching a YouTube video, through listening to a podcast. And I feel both of you have done me such a great service as being mentors to me and my guide, my guide to healing. Mm -hmm. um, so Deneen, I want to turn to you because I know writing this book has, has took so much energy and so much self-discipline and self-compassion mm -hmm. for you to do so. If you would like just Give us a little taste of it. I know okay. it's not ready until 2023. <laughs> right. And I'm sorry, y'all. My apologies. With this, this won't be out until September of 2023. Next year. So we got to bring her back to the festival yeah. next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to read um, just like a page or so of the very first book. Um, it's divided, the book is divided into three books, the Book of Grace, the Book of, of Dolores, and the Book of Ray. Okay. And I'm reading from the Book of Grace. Mm. The blood never much mattered, the blood never much bothered Grace. Mama Rubel got her wet, got her used to it early on when she was little old, way before she let her only granddaughter, her apprentice, tend the stove at her first baby catching, before even Grace's first blood trickled down her thigh. There it was, her monthly, making a dark red liquid trail past her calf and ankle, dripping into the thick, fertile Virginia dirt she'd planted her feet in as she reached for the pins on the laundry line. Grace cocked her head and stared at it in wonder for just a moment, then went on in the outhouse and made her sanitary pad just like Mama Rubel had taught her to do with the pins and ripped pieces of feed sack. Just as natural and nasty as slopping hogs, Grace thought. Now her best friend Cheryl, she didn't see it that way. She cried holy hell when her blood came in. Nobody, not her mama, not her big sissy, not nan, auntie, bothered to tell her what was inevitable. They held it to their chest like a big secret Cheryl had no right to know. Mm -hmm. She near killed her fool self when she saw the red puddle on her little piece of school bench and realized it was oozing from her poom poom. Knocked over the desk, tripped down the rickety schoolhouse steps, and just took off running down toward Harley Pasture, mm -hmm. hollering and screaming like a stuck pig, the laughter of the boys and the screams of Miss Garvey, their school teacher, chasing behind her. But Grace, she understood the power of the blood. Mama Rubel saw to that made her look straight at it for sport and for pr practicality's sake. Mm -hmm. Mama knew, after all, that her grandbaby would have the calling. Saw it in a vision just as plain as day one afternoon as she pulled poke salad roots from the ground deep in the woods down by the river, where she had gone to forage and be still and make offerings to the spirits of her mother and her mother before that. Mm. In the vision, there had been Grace's hands, small, delicate, strong, gently twisting, pulling a baby's head as it emerged between its mother's legs. Mm. The movements, the way Grace's fingers fluttered about the infant's curls, had made Mama's heart beat fast. She could feel her grand granddaughter's happy in the tingle of her own fingertips and each of her own palms. Mama had slowly fallen to her knees, sticks and pebbles digging into the thick of her skirt she'd kissed She'd kiss those palms and press them, warm pulsing from energy, to her cheeks. Love was there. Grace would continue in the tradition of the Adams women. Mama's dead did not lie. Show her the blood they'd whispered in the breeze and the beams of light rushing through the leaves. Show her what she already knows. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get an advanced copy? Oh, right, right. <laughs> right. I'm, like, I'm, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm so, so ready. Mm -hmm. With both of you, you made distinct, I, I want to say declarations about healing your lineage, understanding your history. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do we continue to have these conversations, but not just amongst ourselves, but we'll make sure it's intergenerational? Because that is so key to what we're doing with Well Red Black Girl. Right. It's like, it's not just about, you know, the Instagram, all the, the social media is cute. Right. It's right. real fun. But at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are having real conversations. That's right. We're being vulnerable with one another. And we're creating this for lineage, right? That's right. Because all day I'm like, I'm looking at Maya Angelou. I'm looking at Alice Walker. I'm looking back, I'm looking back, but I also want to look forward. But I think that, I think you're on the right path though with that. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, we're looking back at the classics and yeah. there's so many things to learn from that. 
But what One Blood does, um, and I'm really proud of, is like the relationship between Grace and Mama. Yeah. You know, like that's a very, I, I know that people in here can think of their relationships with their mothers or their grandmothers or an auntie, mm -hmm. and, and they'll talk about that. Yeah. I feel like when you read this book, you're gonna talk about that relationship. Mm -hmm. You're gonna talk about what it means to pass on um, you know, gifts, generational yeah. gifts. Mm -hmm. You're gonna talk about what it means to heal from mm -hmm. some of the pain and trauma that you're gonna experience in this book mm -hmm. and that we all experience. And when we sit down and we, and we talk about this book and relate it to our own lives yeah. and then share it with our kids, right? Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's an adult book, but there's so many themes in here that are necessary to be talked about yeah. with teenage girls, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And teenage boys dog on it but teenage <laughs> everybody <laughs> everybody everybody gets on um but you know uh, i'm hoping that mothers will be able to take this book yeah. and talk to their mothers mm -hmm. and yeah. also their daughters yeah. mm -hmm. and sort of come together around what all of this means yeah. and how the healing happens in this book and how it can happen amongst them. Yeah. So it's, it really is like, it's, it can be nonfiction. Yeah. It could be Alex telling you how she, you know, she worked with her husband to figure out how to deal with something that happened to her as a kid with her dad. Yeah. Or it could be like a very fictional book mm -hmm. that you feel, you can feel that sort of that realness in um, what you've read. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's so beautiful because I think at the end of the day, why I've been so adamant about having a full bookshelf, having a space where I could like read these words because some folks don't necessarily have, you know, the, the caregiver or the parent to provide that. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you really can't miss with the book. Right. You can Absolutely. revisit it, you can go back to it, you can underline, underline it, you can dog it, ear it, highlight, highlight all that. write your little notes write on the, the margins, right. you know, and all those things. And back to what Alex was saying about mothering yourself, you can find the tools and you can find the words to mother yourself and to be the best person that you know how to be. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I, we're gonna open it up to the audience in one second. So if you're marinating on a question that you have for the authors, please let us know. Um, I'm gonna turn to Alex because I want to ask you about what it's been like to come, because again, you had a, a beautiful, I want to say just like a progressive career, mm -hmm. you know, like you've come, you were self-published in one space, you've definitely utilized social media to help build your platform. How does it come feel to be at this stage with this book? Because mm -hmm. I, I, I promise you, I have all of your books. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you. I, and I can see like the growth and progression. So like, do you feel differently about with How We Heal compared to your last book or even compared to your first one? Oh my gosh, first of all, the first one, I wrote it, I was 23 years old. And I looked at it the other day and I was reading and I was like, oh, 10 years as a decade, as a decade and wild. <laughs> and people still buy that book. As they should. I it's a good book. <laughs> it is just so funny to see the growth. Mm -hmm. And as we were talking about backstage, I really feel like How We Heal is the book. Yeah. Like it is the book. And you were, you've written 30 plus books and you feel like One Blood is the, the book, book. Yep. right? Yeah. And so that's how I feel about how we heal. After the Rain, which came out in 2020, was part memoir, part guide, and that needed to get out mm -hmm. of my body. Um, and I'm really proud of that book. But this book is, I hope, going to be the book that folks who look like me and folks who don't yep. can pick it up for generations and generations and generations yep. to come and be like, you don't know how to heal? Here you go. Mm -hmm. Or you want to deepen your healing? Here you go. You need a reminder about the possibility of healing? Yeah. Here you go. Yeah. So I really feel like How We Heal is a progression of my healing yeah. and my growth and my understanding of just self-choosing and the possibility of healing. Yeah. How about you? How do you feel? Because I know you've written all the books. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we know this is the one. But that journey, like just looking back and reflecting on how far you've come. Oh, goodness. I, so I wrote my first book in ooh, 1997. Um, <laughs> it was a good year. 97 was a good year. <laughs> 1997. Lord have mercy. <clears throat> Showing my age. And I was, I was a baby. I was 27. Mm. And thought 
Yeah. Who the hell is trying to take relationship advice from me? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like, how did this happen? <laughs> like, it was literally based off of a story that I was a journalist for, um, for uh, the Daily News in New mm -hmm. York, and I'd written this story about this book called The Rules. I don't know if any of y'all remember this book called The Rules in the 90s, right? It was like on Oprah every five seconds. <laughs> and it was like these two white women from Long Island, who, which is where I'm from, so I can make fun of it, um, <laughs> and, who were telling people, telling women how to get a man. And it was like, you know, play all of these good old days. stupid, <laughs> foolish games, right? The good old days, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, like it was just like a bunch of stupid ideas about how to get a man. And I wrote a story for the Daily News saying that the rules would never work for black women mm -hmm. because black men would never go for them. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know that my boss was gonna put it on the cover of the feature section oh. of the Daily News and that the whole world was gonna see it, right? <laughs> so, and she got my coworker to dress up in a Superman suit oh. and pretend like he was the, on the cover of a book. So she made a mock book and my dumb coworker was standing in a Superman suit like this. Oh my and God. it said, rules for the sisters, can black women find true love? And from that story, mm -hmm. I had a book deal for $50,000 at... Talk about it. <laughs> at 3 o'clock that afternoon. There you go. Like, had no idea, came in eating my bagel, mine and my business. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a call from a publisher like, hey, can you turn this into a book? And I wrote that book in a month. I had a month to what? write it. Jesus. What? I had to write that book in a month. Do not tell my publisher this. <laughs> I did a lot of reckless stuff as a writer. <laughs> and, that, and that's something else, too, that Karen and I have been talking a lot about. Um, about this because mm -hmm. I tell people that I wrote that book in a month and it and it was always a you know like a what you you did this you did that at 54 now I know how foolish Should that was out? she is 54 <laughs> <laughs> like tell us the, the, your, your routine what you wash your face with how much water you drink because ma'am what vitamins you take <laughs> All the things, yes. Pilates. <laughs> like that's that's some good genes somewhere yes. down the line. There's some good genes um, that I, you know, I thank somebody that I don't even know. I thank her for it. <laughs> um, but you know, a big part of my writing journey mm -hmm. was being the one that you could count on, being mm -hmm. the one who, you know, like if I had editors send me twice send me a script mm -hmm. and then have me write a novel based off of the script mm -hmm. in two weeks. Wow. I wrote Nene Leakes' book in 28 days. Wow. That is not normal. That's not. Right? Please. It's not normal it's not. and it hurts. But you're right. But I can need a time out mm. because not only yes you did it but you, the quality right like Top the quality tier. of your work yeah. is so extraordinary thank you. so we can't minimize thank that you. not only did you do it in two weeks but it was high quality thank you thank you yeah. thank you of course. but it was it hurt me yeah. right mm. like like i you know like yes it's it's awesome to hear applause or to have editors you know yeah. constantly come back to me and say i can count on deneen to get this done yeah mm. But that hurt, yeah. mm. right? It's like at what cost? It, right. That was that was me not talking to my kids. Mm. Lila will tell you, like, food not getting cooked, you know, <laughs> laundry not getting done, mm. you know, mommy being mean and mad for like, and and don't talk to, don't look in my direction <laughs> 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 while I'm doing this, yeah. mm -hmm. and and having that, having to answer. And that way with my writing over and over mm, yeah. and over and over and over and over and over again yeah. mm. um, really hurt. Yeah. And so with One Blood, you know, like I got to stretch. Yeah. You know, mm. like we talk about the quality of my work mm -hmm. writing a, a novel in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the quality of my work is when somebody gives me time to do it? Yeah. Listen, listen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so a big part of this 
is getting everybody else in line. Yeah. Like I cannot be counted on to do that in two weeks. Yeah. Not because I can't do it, but because it is not healthy for me yeah, to do that. Yeah, it's not that. sustainable. Right. And what you're speaking to is boundaries as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. placing these Absolutely. boundaries that are realistic expectations of yourself. Absolutely. Letting people, the, the editor, the publisher, whoever, right. take a step back so you can take care of yourself and That's do the right. things that you need to do. That's right. That's so right. do you feel like you felt that now with this book at 54? Or when, or is that something that gradually over time that you were able to start to really set these boundaries? Um, it came, I, I, you know, like, I have to say that it came like with the second healing, the divorce. Yeah. Um, not feeling like I had to take projects because I needed to keep money coming in. Yeah, so that part. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I ain't going front. I still need money coming in. Right, right. 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 But <laughs> let's be clear. Right, right. 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 let's be clear. <laughs> Mama still got to get them checks. Right. But, <laughs> but the quality of the checks is commensurate with the quality of the work. Yes, amen. Right? Yes. And so, um, and mm -hmm. so the, the boundaries came with understanding that that wasn't healthy. Yeah. Not just making other people understand, but understanding it myself. Yeah. Like, mm. bro, I can't do that book yeah. for two cents <laughs> in right. two weeks right. because you were in a rush yeah. right. and you didn't think this through. Yeah. And the person that you tried to get to do it couldn't do it right. right. And so now you're standing at my step, yeah. you know, asking me to come in and save this. Yeah. I, mm. you know, like it's not, it's not good for me. Yeah. And so a whole lot of boundaries you know, yeah. I did a whole lot of practicing on building boundaries mm -hmm. after 2017. Mm -hmm. And it's finally gotten me to this point where, yeah. you know, like, again, the pay is commiserate with the, 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 the work, yeah. right? But also, um, you know, it allows me to, to erect those boundaries and think about me first. Yeah, I mm -hmm. love that. I, um, I'm gonna put my, my brothers out here somewhere in the audience. We, we had a family meeting recently and we were talking about boundaries and I don't know how this happened. He is my younger brother, but suddenly he's like my older brother. Oh, and boy. He's, yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's really, really funny because he's always like, so how? Oh, sorry, y'all. I think I lost my. Is it okay? No, we can still hear you. Okay. You know what, Alex? Thank you, Alex. I got you, both. I got big ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, and so my little big brother has really been the one in our families to be like, all right, we're going to pass the talking stick. Oh. Yeah, yeah he's that brother. <laughs> That's good. And, and it's been, like, really amazing to see my younger brother be able to bring that to our family and, like, yeah. restore peace and mm, order, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. in someone who's younger. And so this, I bring that up only to say that this idea of putting boundaries, like everything else, it needs to be put into practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in your book, you do talk about these different boundaries. And I'm going to pose the same question I did with Deneen in terms of, like, when did you know that you were actually like, okay, like these boundaries are in place and I'm standing firm in them mm. and they're not just something like I said. What I, I said. Yeah. <laughs> That's, so I worked with a coach who's actually a dear friend of mine now. And I realized in working with her that I didn't have boundaries. I had barriers. Mm. Ooh. Yeah. And okay. I remember her saying, I don't think that's a boundary. <laughs> 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 I'm pretty sure you're blocking people out. Mm. So I had to realize and understand that boundaries are flexible mm. and barriers are more impermeable. Mm. Like I have a barrier with my biological father mm. and I have that because I need to be kept safe. Yeah. Boundaries I have with people I love, with yeah. my husband, with my kids, with my mom, you know what I'm saying? Like they're flexible, they're mm -hmm. fluid, they feel safe. Yeah, keywords, safe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And honored. Yeah. Mm. And then I had to realize, well, if you're going to set boundaries with people, you also have to honor your own boundaries. Yeah. Because I was putting all the boundary honoring on people outside of me. Mm. Like, they need to honor my boundary. Yeah. And then my coach would be like, that's not a boundary. Mm. It's a two-way street. Yeah. You're setting a barrier right now. L let's shift that and figure out how we can make this more flexible and soft. Yeah. And how you need to do better mm -hmm. at 
honoring the boundaries that you're setting for others. Because if people see us dishonoring our boundaries, they're not going to honor yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that took a lot of work. Like if I tell my, if I tell someone in my life, like, hey, I don't call my phone after nine. I'm asleep. Mm -hmm. But they keep calling my phone after nine, and I keep picking, picking up. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's right. the point of having the boundary? That's right. 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 And so it's like looking at those little things and like, okay, I'm not picking up the phone. They might call me three, four, five more times after nine. I'm not picking up the phone. Yeah. They won't call me the sixth time. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Right. And if they do, it's like, okay, let's have a conversation. Right. I've asked you not to call me after nine o'clock because mm -hmm. I'm asleep. Yeah. Right. You know, so it's like those, again, back to basics. Yeah. Boundaries don't have to be this like big, huge thing. Mm -hmm. Um, to be honored and to be respected. Yeah. And I do believe that they can be shifted and um, changed and they can look different every day sometimes. Yeah. So I had to really learn how to honor them myself before I really started like implementing them. Yeah. And I with think others. all these things that we're speaking to, it comes back to the self, like the yeah. self-compassion, the self-forgiveness, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. honoring your own boundaries before you post them on other people. Mm -hmm. It always starts with the self, but... For some reason, we like everybody else. Right, 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 right. right. <laughs> like, all right. y'all over there. Yep. Right. You know, it's, yep. just, it's so much easier to look outward versus inward. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's because we're conditioned to do that. Yeah. yeah. We're taught early on to, to do that. And what I'm trying to teach my kids is like, look at yourself. Yeah. Even my younger ones who are four and three, they terrorize us. <laughs> they really do. They're so cute, but they are terrors. <laughs> And I even see them like having their own boundaries yeah. when they're playing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes Isla will say, Maxie is not honoring my boundaries. I asked her not to throw that at me <laughs> and she threw it at me and she's not honoring my boundaries. <laughs> I because I say that to them like, hey, I'm in the kitchen right now. I'm cooking. I don't want y'all running in and out. Please honor my boundaries. Right. And so it's like we have to lead by example yes. because our kids are watching. Yes. And the people that we love, even if we don't have kids, are watching. Yes. So I often tell folks we have to heal by example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have to lead by example. You don't have to over talk your healing. Yeah. You don't have to over talk your boundaries. People are bearing witness to you. And yeah. I think that that's what's so beautiful about our intentional healing practice yeah. is because we don't have to say much. We just have to change. Yes. And people will follow suit yeah. and they will see. And I think that that's really important too. You know what I'm going to say? Mm. Self-witnessing. Yep. Because that's what it is. Yes. It's like honoring yourself. And, it, and again, I am so, so thrilled that we're having this conversation because if you've been following Well Read Black Girl long enough, most of the books, most of the things that you're reading and experiencing are things I'm experiencing firsthand as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going through this thing. I'm going through this transition. Let me read about it. And because I'm interested, I'm hoping the community will be interested as well. So yeah. I try to really present my most authentic self. And so clearly this rest is resistance. This is my season of rest. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is like how we heal. I want to be able, because I am turning 40 this year, y'all. You're what? Yeah, girl. girl I, yeah. I, 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 I'm 33, so I need to know everyone's secret. This one, this one talking. Okay, yeah. right. this one talking. I drink lots of wine. <laughs> we need well-read black girl beverages. Thank you. Yes. 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 All of me. <laughs> But I am truly, truly, truly like been through so many transitions within the last two years, given the pandemic, given motherhood, right. the separations, right. just like all kinds of things have hit my orbit. And I'm just like so determined to heal and to confront the things that I either neglected or willfully ignored, because mm. that's a right. whole other thing, right. mm -hmm. like, <laughs> you know, right. and I'm just like, I'm home. I feel I, I feel so blessed because on the other side of this is yes, you may be grieving, you may be losing, but there's also the joy in the healing that I feel like we don't speak to enough either. There is so much joy in finding yourself. Absolutely, you know? absolutely, absolutely. I bought my first house on my own. Clap um, for that. <laughs> two years ago, like right when the pandemic, when they shut down Georgia or parts of Georgia, cause you know, can't think I know goddamn sense. Um, <laughs> when they shut down Atlanta, okay. 
Um, I moved into my house the day that they shut down Atlanta. Um, or a week afterwards, and I had to talk the movers into coming and moving my stuff. And I was really deliberate mm -hmm. about filling my house with things that bring me joy. Yeah. Now, I've always loved interior design, mm -hmm. and I've always loved being in a space that's comfortable and pretty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to have my own space that I got to decorate yeah. on my own, <laughs> I didn't have to worry about nobody where they were putting their dirty clothes. <laughs> I didn't have to worry about what color, you know, is, are you comfortable with this pink? I, none of that. I don't have to worry about any of that. And when you walk into my house, and it's not for everybody else, it's for me, but yeah. you know, like you're welcome to enjoy it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, when you walk into my house, you are surrounded by beauty. Yeah which to me is joy, yes, right? Yes. It's just being in a place where things are pretty and there's art everywhere mm -hmm. and the sofas have, you know, pillow. I know you, the boys don't really like all the pillows, but I like pillows, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, you know, like there's, you know, just texture and color mm -hmm. everywhere. And, you know, one room is just completely black and because mm -hmm. I like black and it's pretty yeah. and, mm -hmm. and it'll work and it makes sense. Um, but those things bring me joy yeah. and walking into my house brings me joy. Mm. Being in my house brings me joy, yes. right? Yeah. Um, and folks may not necessarily understand that. Um, and I guess people f had to figure that out during the pandemic, right? Oh, that yeah. you have to you have to be okay with being with yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. And, um, and I'm okay with creating spaces specifically for me. Yeah, yeah. it's mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. Okay, y'all, this is the moment. If you have a question, we have some mics here. We have some lovely library staff that will be supporting. If you have a question, come on down. Don't be shy. And in the meantime, I'm gonna turn back to you, Alex, because I really loved your answer about how you were feeling during the pandemic or buying your first home and all the joy and all the things that you experienced. I'm really curious to hear what is bringing you joy right now mm. and how you're just like sustaining that joy. My morning walks. Oh, oh can you talk about morning walks? <laughs> right, okay, okay, yes. Answer that question and expand about the morning walks. Like, so a year and some change ago, I committed to walking every single day. And I walk every single day. And I don't listen to anything. I go on my walks and it's... A moving meditation for me mm -hmm. and that's bringing me a lot of joy um, writing this book was really hard yeah. I also was ghost writing a book mm -hmm. for someone while I was writing this book oh, wow. and that yeah. was really hard and so I feel like I'm really out of words a yeah. lot of the time mm. and I get to put as my dear friend Libby says motion to my emotions mm. when I am moving and walking and being with nature. This is my favorite time of year to walk. Yeah. But I realize I hate walking in the summertime. It's not fun. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I love the fall and I love the spring. And like just seeing the colors yeah. of the trees changing and listening to the birds and seeing all the little squirrels look all chaotic while they're like <laughs> gathering stuff. <laughs> I just love it. And it just makes me happy. And I realize that I don't need a lot. Mm. to feel held and to yeah. feel joyful mm. yeah, I so love that. that's my that's my little thing my walk i love that <laughs> i've been following your um your journey online too my and this morning walk yes, page with yes, yes. <laughs> so fyi if you haven't if you're not aware alex has this amazing page called this morning walk you should follow it because i really feel like i'm walking with you it's really oh, fun. i love it it's really fun it's like it's very it's, it's very <clears throat> meditative and can you say it again you said putting your emotion to emotion Putting your em putting your mo putting your emotions with motion. With motion, mm -hmm. I like it's almost like exercise too. It's like just moving your body and getting out of like, out of your head. Out of your head, yeah, yeah, yep. and being present. And being present. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yep. We have two brave souls who came up <laughs> for questions. Give them a round of applause. We yes, thank y'all. Can you all hear? Okay. Yeah. Um, so there has been so much research that shows how trauma can be inherited and particularly for black people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um part of our healing is finding out whose trauma it is if mm. it's not 
our own. Mm -hmm. yeah. And particularly you, Alex, and talking about boundaries, um, in my own personal journey, I have found that some of the people who are very close to me have had issues with me trying to find out whose trauma something is. Mm. Um, and just the, the culture of silence mm. around trauma that has happened in the black community. Mm. And knowing that there's something there, but you might not know what it is. Mm. Yeah. And so in your, both of your journeys, um, one, have you had that experience where people have um, had a negative or very sharp critique of you or had a negative reaction to a boundary that you have put up mm -hmm. and you are the one now doing the healing and mm -hmm. it seems i will just say it seems a little bit unfair that like you're doing the work but somebody else is actually the issue yeah mm -hmm. so i guess my question is how have you dealt with people who have negative reactions to your own personal healing journey, particularly mm. when they are people who are very close to you mm. and who you might not want to put up a barrier to? Like yeah. it, it would maybe hurt, it would harm you in some way. So that's my question. That's a really that's good a question. question. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, one, yes, I've had that happen mm -hmm. to me. And something that I had to really come to terms with was remembering whose work that is. Mm -hmm. And other people's problems is not my work yeah. when it comes to um, my healing. And so if someone is upset with me because I set a boundary or, or have a, has a sharp critique of me because maybe they're unhealed in some yeah. way, mm -hmm. I don't take that on. I used to, it was really hard mm -hmm. to not take it personally, but something that I've learned just in my spiritual growth and in my healing is that like m the healed version of me can offer grace to the unhealed version of someone else. Mm -hmm. And like just trusting yeah. that it's okay if people don't understand or don't get it. Yeah. Like that's not my work. Yeah. And I remember speaking to, <laughs> to the, my same friend, coach, and complaining about somebody in my life who I'm close with and that I love, and I was complaining. And like, they're not doing their work. I'm doing all the work. They're not doing their work. They always got something to say. I'm just going off. And she said, well, what's your work? Wow. She redirected me because I was trying to figure out why this other person refuses to do their work. She's like, but that's not your business. Right. <laughs> like, and I was mad. I'm like, girl, that is my business. And she was like, no, it's not your business. Your business, again, is to keep healing by example and leading by example. Yeah. And as much as we may not like that, that's the truth. Because the only people we can control is our only person we can control is ourselves. We cannot yeah. control other people. Yeah. And as a control freak, working on it, yeah. that can be very tough. Yeah. And so just honoring where people are knowing where I am and not being swayed by other people's bad behavior yeah. and remembering that, okay, the, I'm healed, I'm healing. Yeah. The healed version of me will honor the unhealed version yeah. of them <laughs> and I'm getting there, you know, and it's hard, but that's yeah. the, but that's the humanness, yeah. you know, like rem remembering that we're all trying to human, right? you know, and just like trauma is passed down, I think healing is passed down. Yeah. And, yeah. and as we heal by example and lead by example, the more healing ends up in our body. Yeah. And I think that that's a really beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. Your, I have to tell you, your, your question kind of sets me. And I'm sitting here trying to figure out how to answer it without bursting into tears. Mm. And, um, and to, to give the context in, in a very quick way, um, you know, my whole life as an adopted child is someone else's secret for me, mm. right? And so doing the work in discovering, um, you know, during the research about my own self, um, haphazardly in the beginning and then purposefully toward the end. Mm. 
um, I still haven't told everybody in my family. I haven't told anybody, actually, in my family except for my daughters. Um, and I guess y'all gonna find out now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of the information that I've, I've come across, that I've, that I've discovered as mm -hmm. a journalist and a researcher mm -hmm. and, a, and a novelist mm -hmm. um, about myself. Mm. Um, I don't know how to answer your question because I don't know how to hurt my dad, mm. right? I don't want to hurt my dad. My dad and my mom made the decision to keep my adoption um, to themselves, mm. in part because that's what they did in the 60s, in yeah. part because it probably felt better to like, you know, just go ahead and create this family, and this family is our family, and that's all there is to it, mm. right? And in part because who wants to you know, reckon with the idea that your child may one day look up and say, I know you're my mom and my dad, but you know, who's my mom and my dad, mm -hmm. right? And so I don't want to hurt him. And so, you know, I'm not quite sure how to um, get someone else, i.e. my dad and his mm -hmm. family to, I'm afraid to give him you know, this information that I've found because I'm afraid of dealing with the consequences of what giving him that information would mean for our relationship, mm. for how he looks at me, for why I'm even looking. Mm. And isn't that crazy that I'm a 54-year-old woman mm. with children of my own and I'm still A, afraid to go to my dad and tell him some stuff. And my dad is the sweetest man on the planet. Like, you know, he wouldn't get angry or anything. I, I fear his disappointment mm -hmm. of, you know, um, of having his daughter go looking for someone, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so I'm reckoning with that right now. And I'm not quite sure what to do with how to present the information and how to deal with the fallout from it. Mm. I can say it's not easy and be gentle with yourself. Yeah. And there will be some days where you find out some things and it's just like, <sighs> yeah. maybe I need to hold on to this. And, as, and, this, and I, I, you know, like, yes, we say, you know, like run directly into the wall and just tell everybody and deal with it. <laughs> and everybody just gonna have to, you know, like do the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that is not as easy as it sounds, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just me being honest. Mm -hmm. oh, we love you. We, we appreciate your vulnerability. We Thank you, you, baby. Yeah. Thank you. start by saying thank you to you ladies for just this session. I felt like it was a very therapeutic session for us all. And uh, we'll start the first question to you, Alex. Um, I think when you were mentioning something that brings you joy, I thought of something that brings me joy that I do almost every day is listen to your meditations on Insight Timer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank and you. As a local, I don't know if you do anything similar to that, like in person, or if that's something in your future agenda, I think um, sessions like this are, you know, not everyone has access to like therapy or meditations, mm -hmm. but I would be very interested, I'm sure a lot of people in this crowd as well, um, to have those like in person or workshops or something like that, if that's in your horizon in any way. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I haven't done meditations and teaching over the past few years is because of, you know, over the past few years, COVID and stuff, but mm -hmm. absolutely in 2023, we'll be bringing back more local in-person group breath work, group journaling sessions, yes. and I'm excited for that. Yes. Thank you. Um, if you guys, those are free meditations on. Uh, yeah, they're free. Yeah, Go so stream them. Yeah. Um, and Deneen, I think um, I had to look up your birthday because I was like, oh, she must be a Libra when she was talking about her home. Because how did you know, girl? I'm a yeah. <laughs> I'm a Libra, and um, yeah. I like home is so important you to know. me. You yeah. know, right? <laughs> and so I don't know if you wanted to share, like, is there something in your home or a special room that you love the most? I was just curious as a Libra because that's such a special part of me. Sure. And part is just my space is so important to me, and I just was curious. About sure, well. sure, sure. So I have two spaces that really, really make me happy: my bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
it is the most cozy, soft, but firm, you know, <laughs> warm, inviting. There's no television in my room. Mm -hmm, There's same. only music and books. And I have a deck outside with like right. us that's the length of the room and I can go and sit out there and watch the sunrise. Mm. And then if I turn this way, I can watch the sunset. So I love my bed. And then I have a room that I call the black room. Mm -hmm. And there's like this beautiful piece that I splurged on like in a seen amount of money, but when I saw it, I needed it. <laughs> I, I needed it. It wasn't it wasn't I wanted, I needed it. <laughs> and um and the room is black. And I designed it around this piece mm -hmm. that my agent bought for me um, by this artist named Ingrid uh, Bars. Mm -hmm. And it's just this beautiful black woman with these really distinctive features mm -hmm. and her whole face is gold and the mm -hmm. background wow. is black. Oh, so I wow. had it framed so that it's all black and her face pops off the, oh, off of the, wow. the um, off of the, the canvas oh, wow. and I designed the whole room around that piece and yeah. so that piece is on a black wall and when you walk in that's what you see is like this big golden beautiful mm. oh, that sounds so woman beautiful. full of energy and mm. then the whole room is just full of art it's where I sip bourbon it's where I watch hey. Little Housewives yes. it's, it's it's where I watch the sunset I love that I love that yeah. room so hard yeah I love thank that. you thank you ladies Invite us over to the black uh, You got to come. You got to come. You got to come. Come to Atlanta. Come to my house. I love cooking. I love entertaining. Thanksgiving is coming. I got yeah. my people coming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it looks like we have a question on this side. Hello. I might be the last one. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Oh, yeah. We can hear yes. you. Um, so I've spent the last few years just really working on the healing piece. Um, my mother was a rager. She was very violent and, you know, one of my most remarkable memories of her is like I was five and she told me she hated me and, you know, split my lip and I couldn't go to school. Oh boy. And many of my childhood years are riddled with memories like that, but I love my mother. Mm. Um, and I am in the unique position of now nurturing her and mothering her. Mm. Um, and she's very young. She's only 59. Beautiful woman. Um, but I struggle, and, and, and now I'm doing the hard work of being the mother that my mother wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very affectionate with my children. Maybe a little too much that, you know, my son's 14 and he's like, stop kissing me before I leave school. <laughs> um, but I struggle with the memories. Yeah. And I just don't know how to... Mm, Mm -hmm. okay. you, I'm you. soft, I can cry. Yeah. Um, mm. I struggle with what happens to me when those memories come back. Okay. Because they don't force me to be angry with my mother. I'm not angry with her. I have, I understand that my mother could only give me what she received. Mm. So she only was able to give me what she had and yeah. you cannot take a million dollars out of an account that got five dollars in it mm -hmm. um, and so I I just don't know really how to do the work of letting those memories happen mm -hmm. and not have some kind of very strong emotional reaction to yeah. them mm -hmm. um, so what would you say to a person like me who is intentionally healing yeah. Um, but just can't stop the thinking. Mm. <clears throat> I wish that I had my mother to ask questions. Mm. I wish that she was here. A big part of, of One Blood and the Book of Dolores in particular is me asking questions of my mother. Mm. Mm. Right? She wasn't violent like your mom, but she wasn't necessarily the warmest person. Yeah. Mm. She was very much a children are to be seen, not heard kind of person. Mm. And my, the emotional connection <clears throat> came with my dad. Mm. Yeah. Um, but there were so many things that I wish that I was able to ask her as a woman and a mother that I didn't think to ask her as a kid because I was too busy being quiet right. mm. um, and too, too busy trying not to, you know, kind of get into that line of, of anger. 
or whatever it was that was making her act the way that she acted toward our family. Mm -hmm. And so I think the blessing here is that you have your mother still. Yeah. yeah. And when those things come up, what better way to figure out why she was doing what she was doing than to actually talk to her about it. Yeah. Mm. And get her to explain to you, and maybe she doesn't even know, maybe she has no clue, but maybe there's something there that um, in her past that made her act that way to you. Yeah. And maybe she needs to work through those things and maybe, I don't wanna say you were put on the earth to like help her work through her things because you know, it's her work, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But perhaps that might help you is to be able to ask the questions. Yeah. Like, when you did this, uh, we can't, I can't ignore that you did this. Mm -hmm. So when you did this, what was what was going on? What was happening? Yeah. Like we already know that it wasn't it wasn't right for her to do it. Yeah. Maybe an apology might come from it. Maybe she doesn't remember it like you do. Mm -hmm. mm. But it's a conversation that you get to have. Yeah. So that you can figure out maybe having a full picture of what actually happened in that led to that moment will help you um, understand it. And when you understand something, yeah. you heal better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I don't know, I'd, I would talk to her. Yeah. I wish my mother was here for me to talk. A lot of my talking happened in my dreams with yeah. my mother mm. Mm. and still do. I'll take advantage of the time I have with her. Mm. Do that. Thank yeah. you, thank you. Um, I would say how I handled coming from a mother who was a rager and who was violent. I cry about it. Mm -hmm. I go, I get in the shower, and I have a moment. Now I go for walks and I breathe through it because I know that, you know that feeling when it's like, okay, this thought is here, mm -hmm. but I know it's not gonna be here forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just giving myself a moment to be with the thought mm -hmm. and then knowing it's going to go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a big part of my healing work has been the honoring mm -hmm. and the accepting that I can't change my mom's yeah. violence towards me from when I was a kid. But I can change how I love my kids. Mm -hmm. which is what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, also, I really love how you were saying, like, your mom essentially did what she could with what she had. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to come to the realization of, too. Like, all she, all she offered was all she knew. Yeah. And um, that's hard, though, when you are a child of a rager. It is hard, and it's hard even as an adult person to go and have that conversation with someone who technically is your abuser. Mm -hmm. Because let, let's just call it what it is, mm -hmm. right? And when I started realizing that my mother was just a woman and not just my mother. That part, yeah. Grace really started that to kind part. of yep. swirl. Mm -hmm. And me and my mom started having conversations a few years ago, when I turned 30, actually. So 30 was a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> she apologized mm -hmm. to me for the first time in my life on my 30th birthday. Wow. And it was... I remember like a couple weeks prior to, I know we're short on time, I'll be quick. A couple weeks prior to the apology, I was really upset with her because I was having a hard time accepting her for who and where she was. Mm -hmm. And I was fussing at Ryan, my husband, and saying like, she's just whatever, whatever, whatever. She needs to apologize to me. And I was just going off, crying, emotional, and he said, if she said sorry to you, what would that change for you? Mm. And I didn't have an answer. Right. 
He said, you'd still be mad. Mm. Mm. You'd still be hurt. And you still would not be ready to forgive her. Mm. And so when she apologized, it, I don't think I said, I forgive you, but I softened. Mm. And it opened up the door for more conversation and more life experience that she was sharing with me of where she was when, when she was so stressed and filled with rage. And I will never forget, she told me, um, everything else in the world was out of my control. Mm-hmm. And when I came home, I wanted to control home. So when you were being a kid, wow. you know how kids get on your nerves, whatever. Yeah. It, I wanted, I didn't, I wanted to control the situation. And so her not having control in the world as a black woman, her being sexually harassed at work and all the things that she was going through, she didn't have the tools to love me. She does now. And I'm giving her the space to do that. She also says things about Charlie, because Charlie was born, I was 18. And that she really started, Charlie started being the glue, kind of, to our family, our very small family. I'm the only child. So it's me, my mom, my stepdad, and they never had children. And and, and my mom said that Charlie was her do-over. Wow. And I remember being hot (laughs) hearing that. (laughs) Hot because I'm like, oh, so you know how to act. (laughs) <laughs> but also hurt yeah. also hurt and I remember us having a conversation and I told her that that hurt me and she goes I know I wasn't trying to hurt you I know that how that came off but I really Charlie really is my do-over Wow. she allows me she was the first person I could really show that I could love wow And she's an amazing grandmother to my girls. And so I share that to say it is multifaceted. And when those feelings come, let them come. Go for a walk, get in the shower, cry into your pillow, write a letter to your younger self of protection and you are safe now. And just allow yourself to be with it because your mother is just a woman. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are, uh, oh, we have, oh, two, okay. Can we do two we'll, more? We'll, this no. we are our last two, uh, bla- and then we gotta, then we gotta go. We gotta go. <laughs> so an abbreviated, yes. yes. Of course. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for this wonderful conversation and just being in the presence of such beautiful people. Um, I just, I guess I have a quick question. I come from, well, I'm 22 years old. Um, and I come from a family of service, and I am just now starting this healing journey and understanding what that is. I always served, and my family's always served as like first responders for our community and for anyone in need. And I'm just coming back from finishing university in New York and about to transition into studying and preparing for like law school and such. And I don't want to do that running on empty, which I have been for a very long time. So I guess my condensed question is, what is your advice? And this might be just like a small question, but where do I start from here? Where mm-hmm. should I go? Where do I begin? There's so much going on, so much like, you know, little TikTok, so many like <laughs> how to's and books and like, it's like how to fix your life guides. Um, but I, like, I don't know where to start or begin until, of course, your book is released November 8th, but um, <laughs> until then, how do I kind of start this journey and kind of get through the thick of it? Mm. We'll hold you right there. Alex, you're going to answer that one, and we're going to have you ans- to ask your question, and Denise, you're going to answer your okay. question. <clears throat> what I would say is self-care is an act of community care, mm. and so taking care of yourself, finding the things, and not in the corny Instagrammable way, so I bought this latte, so hashtag self-care, but like, <laughs> <laughs> but like 
Are you drinking enough water? Are you making yourself a nice meal? Are you like putting lotion on your feet? Like things like that, pouring into yourself and loving yourself how you do other folks is really, really valuable. And if you are going to be of service to your community, you must also be of service to yourself. Yes. Yeah. Baby step. Baby step. Yeah. <laughs> My fellow Libra. You get to answer that <laughs> Libra. Yes. I live in a three generational home, and you all really touched on a lot of points that I feel like will help that healing conversation. So I feel myself in like this bridge situation of not trying to pass down my mother's trauma, mm -hmm. but also feeling like healing fatigue. And mm -hmm. I'm like, why me? But you know, why not me? Mm -hmm. And what tips would you give like your great granddaughter for mm -hmm. her healing journey? Cool. Wow, such a beautiful question. Who for my great granddaughter, a healing journey. The lineage. Um, um, like trying to understand who came before her and honoring them. I mean, that it's real simple. Um, you know, I've, I've been teaching my daughters and they're learning on their own how to honor their ancestors mm. in indigenous ways that, you know, up until now or, you know, relatively recently, it seems like the mainstream shunned. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's like, baby, know who you, your stock know mm. who you come from yeah. because you know whether you know you were Betty Milner who worked on the assembly line at Estee Lauder that's my mama mm -hmm. or you're Den or you're thinking about Deneen Milner who wrote you know 31 a, a bunch of New York Times bestsellers and you know a 31 bunch. books and runs a children's book imprint and did all these other things that her mother, that were in her mo what her mother's wildest dreams. Mm -hmm. You come from great stock. Mm -hmm. Recognize that and honor it, yeah. because we are going to look out for you, yeah. mm -hmm. whether in this realm or the next. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, man. I think that's the perfect, perfect, perfect way to close. I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you for being here. I recognize a lot of beautiful faces. I hope I will see you tomorrow at the festival. Um, Alex will be speaking again on the healing panel. Deneen will be in the audience with her daughter. I'm looking at you. Come through. <laughs> yeah. I might ask you to do a TikTok dance. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, I, again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the amazing library, the Library Foundation. Yeah. Just like, <laughs> I love it here. Come, use your library card, do, do all the things, use the space. It's a community space. It is so necessary and vital to our community. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you, baby. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. This Thank so you. Good. Thank yeah. you.